Good morning and welcome to all of those that are joining us on live streaming today and through YouTube or whatever platform you may have. Today we are just grateful for the opportunity that we can be here together. Uh, I just want to continue in our joy and our, our announcement last week that Jesus Christ has risen. And each Sunday we take this reminder that something that's happened 2,000 years ago because of His resurrection, we are here worshiping today. Thank you for that. I do have some, uh, some announcements for you. Um, I just want to take this moment and uh, thank all the people. You know, South Lake Sandy Baptist is really an international church now. We have uh, people viewing from our sister church in Ukraine, all the way parts of Europe, and even way those nice people in Delbo. Okay. <laughs> it's not as funny when people don't laugh here, personally. But I do have some announcements for you. Uh, I just want to remind you at 7 o'clock each night, uh, we invite you to just take a minute to pause and pray with your fellow uh, uh, congregation. Even though we're physically apart, we can still be united in prayer, praying for one another, praying for our families, our communities, and all the people that need to make decisions about how we live throughout uh, this community. Uh, we do have lots of information on our website, again, SouthLakeSandyBaptist.org. Be sure to check it out. We keep it up to date as much as we can. We also, also, we also keep uh, Facebook up to date, and we make several posts there. So make sure you uh, subscribe or check those sites out. Again, it might sound like a broken record, but it's very important to uh, our congregation. If you can't leave your house for whatever reason there is, uh, and you need groceries or medicine or, or something, please, please, please contact either Pastor Bob or the deacons. We are here to help you in any way we can. So please keep that in mind. And if you're new to, your, new to us, again, I want to thank you and welcome. Thank you for taking this time for watching us. May God bless you in this experience. Let's take a moment of prayer. Thank you. Dear Lord Jesus, again, we lift up our, all those who are listening, Lord Jesus. You are a master of all. You know what's going on, Lord. You know what's exactly, this is your plan, Lord Jesus. You may not feel comfortable. We may not like it, Lord, but you are involved in all of this, Lord. And I rely on that. I worship that, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that. Lord, thank you for this time that we can be together. Continue to bless us in our worship, our preaching, and just as we pray together, even though apart, that we are here worshiping you together. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Good Listen as I bring a call to worship this morning. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we do not yet see, yet whom we love, whom we have not yet met, yet whom we trust. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and praise and celebrate what he has done for us. Join us as we sing together, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Oh 
Good morning. I'm so glad to be able to greet you once again on this beautiful Lord's Day. You know, oftentimes at the close of our service, I will say this. Now we have been the church gathered. And as we leave this building, we will become the church scattered. Well, the last time we were the church gathered was back on March 15th. And since then, we have been the church scattered into our homes. But you know, we remain the church wherever we are. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. And we are one in the Lord Jesus. And so I want you to know that we are praying for you. I'm praying for you. Tina's praying for you. We try to stay in touch with you. And one of the things I'm trying to do in order to encourage you through this time, because I know it's discouraging. I know we have days where anxiety might raise its head and we are all filled with uncertainties. So one of the things I started doing right after Easter is I'm posting a, a daily note and I'm calling it Hope Notes. And each day I'm focusing briefly on a passage of scripture and drawing our attention to the, to the hope that we have in Christ and what that hope brings to us. And those are posted to uh, Facebook, to our Facebook page, and they appear every morning around 8 o'clock, although there isn't one today, but they appear every morning around 8 o'clock. If you don't have access to Facebook, if we can, if we can email one to you, uh, contact me and give me your email address. We want to make sure that you're getting those those hope notes, if at all possible. Now, as we normally do in our time of worship here, we take some time for confession. We take some time to come before the Lord and to acknowledge that we're needy and to bring our needs to Him. You know, I think we have some unique temptations, some unique problems as we are in this time of isolation, being in our homes. One of the things, and I know this is true because I, I sense it at times in myself, and that is the temptation to turn inward and to become very, very self-absorbed, just simply to think about myself and my needs and what, what I need to take care of and not really be thinking about my neighbors or other people around me. This time has put stresses on many, stresses on marriages, stresses on relationships. So I think it's appropriate now that we just bow our heads together. And I don't know what it may be, only the Lord knows, and you know what it may be on your heart this morning that you need to bring to the Lord and you need to acknowledge and to ask for his forgiveness. So let's just take a moment now for prayer before the Lord. Father, you search us and you know us. There is nothing hidden about us. And when, when we become aware of our sins, we have no need to run and hide. We have no need to rationalize, excuse, or, or cover up. We are told to come to you, to come before the throne of grace, to confess our sins, and to receive the knowledge of your forgiveness and the joy that comes with it. And so we come now in honesty before you. In Jesus' name, amen. And then as we always do, we remind ourselves of the, the good news that we have. And this time I'm taking the, the good news from back in Psalm 103. Listen to these words. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed his transgressions from us. Praise God.
chapter 6. We're continuing in our series entitled The Gospel of John, Witnesses to the Son of God. And our sermon this morning is entitled The Savior's Obedience Brings Our Salvation and Security. Picking up our text in John chapter 6, we're going to be reading verses 35 through 40. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe me. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Are you looking for life? You're in the right place. The Gospel of John is, is all about life. It is, it is the Gospel account where the word life occurs again and again and again. Jesus is presented as the source of life. His mission is to give life. And we'll see more about that when we get to chapter 10, where we hear Jesus say, I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. The book was written so that people could have life through faith in Jesus. In John's great purpose statement towards the end of his account, in John 
20 and, and verse 31. He says, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So if you're looking for life, real life, this is the place to be. Today I want to pose three questions. And the first one is this. How does Jesus speak to our greatest need? How does Jesus speak to our greatest need? He speaks to our greatest need in terms of hunger and thirst. Using the terms hunger and thirst, which he uses here in our text, makes the point that with that what Jesus is dealing with is not something trivial, but something that is vital, something that is very, very essential. We know that our, our bodies have requirements for food and water in order to survive, but our hearts, our hearts have requirements as well. It is, it is to the hunger and thirst of the heart that Jesus is speaking here. A long time ago, one of the great leaders and theologians of the early church, Augustine, said, Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in Thee, O God. Jesus is speaking to a very, very important need, the hunger of our hearts. In our previous messages from chapter 6, we saw that a key word is bread. You may remember I said, in a sense, the word bread is what this entire chapter uh, revolves around. In the opening of the chapter, we saw in verses 1 through 13, Jesus feeding the 5,000, multiplying, creating and multiplying bread along with fish. But then, Jesus later talked about a different kind of bread. He said, that, he said that God is the source of this bread. In verse 32, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, referring back to the manna that fed the Israelites in the wilderness, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. So he moves from talking about physical bread to another kind of bread, and he says, of this bread, God alone is the source. Then, as it were, Jesus drew a circle around himself, and he made one of his most amazing statements, the first of the, the I am statements that is recorded in John in verse 35, where he said, I am the bread of life. What an amazing thing. I am the bread of life. I'm the source. If you're going to find real life, if you're going to find that which is truly nourishing in the ultimate way, you're going to find it in and through me. And then Jesus, of course, is extending this as a wonderful invitation. He said, he who comes to me, he who comes to me will never hunger. There is an invitation in that. There is an invitation. The invitation is come and eat. That is the gospel invitation. The announcement of the good news of Jesus Christ is an invitation in itself. Come to him. Believe in him. Receive eternal life in him. Receive the bread of life. And there is a problem, of course. We see in this passage there are some people that have a bread problem. Well, some people today have a bread problem just in the sense of they want to stay away from it. They're counting their calories. They, they, they're, you know, they're avoiding a lot of carbs. Uh, they may have a bread problem in that sense, but Jesus is, Jesus is talking about a far more uh, significant bread problem. He said some of his hearers actually had, verse 36, he said, but as I told you, speaking to this group of people, mixed group of believers and non-believers, he said, but as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. What a sad statement, isn't it? This is the great tragedy. You have seen me and you do not believe. Some people have a bread problem. They will not acknowledge their need of the Savior. They will not come to him. They will not partake of him. I hope that's not true 
for you. And, it, and if it has been true, if you've had that bread problem, you've not, you've not thought that you had a need for the Savior and you've never come to Him, that can change today. That can change right now. Jesus is speaking to our, to our greatest need and He alone can fill our greatest hunger and, and He fills it with His very life. Now here is our second question. How is it how is it that Jesus can be the bread of life? And this is what John so wants us to see and know. You know, I've looked at this passage, I've looked at this text again and again. That's why we're not taking it in a large chunk, because there's so much here to see. So much that's important, we just can't skip over it. But as I looked at this again this past week, this one aspect of it just stood out to me. Jesus is the bread of life because of who he is and what he does. He is the bread of life because of who he is and what he does. And who he is is, is, made, is made clear by his amazing claims, starting back in chapter 3 and verse 16, where he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who is he? Who does he claim to be? The one and only Son. We saw in, in, in chapter 5, he, he talked about the unique relationship that he has with his Father. He said, my Father is working and I am working right alongside him. And now here it is again in chapter 6 and, and verse 35, the unique identity of Jesus in which he says, I am the bread of life. Who he is, is he is the unique son of God. Jesus is the bread of life because of, of who he is and what he does. What he does, and this is a key statement here in this section, what he does is he obeys the Father's will. This is very important. He obeys the Father's will. This is a theme that runs through John's account. Here it is in verse 38. Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, if you want to turn with me in the Gospel of John, I want, to, I want us to see how this thread runs, runs through this entire chapter. So if we go back to chapter 4, and there... After Jesus has had that amazing encounter with the woman of Samaria at, at the well, and then his disciples have come back, and he's talking with the disciples there in Samaria, and Jesus makes this statement. Chapter 4 and verse 34, My food, Jesus said, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The most Jesus is saying, in that setting, my most, my highest priority is I, I need to eat physically just like everyone else does, but my food, my, my ultimate satisfaction is coming by doing my Father's will, completing His work, because that's what I've been given. Now we hear it here in John chapter 6, where He talked about doing the Father's will. And then if you look over to John chapter uh, 16, John chapter 16 and verse 28. He said in 1628, I, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the Father and going back to the, going back to the Father. I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. In other words, Jesus is reminding his disciples, I'm here on a mission. I've come from the Father, I've come into the world, I come on His mission. I am here, this is another way of Jesus saying, everything I'm doing is I'm, I'm here to do His will. And then if you look just following this, in chapter 17, Jesus' great prayer that He prays shortly before His arrest uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. What a wonderful statement He is able to make at this point in time. Chapter 17 and verse 4. As he speaks to the Father, he says, I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Way back in chapter 4, 
My food, my meat is to do the Father's will. Now, at, at the very end with the cross, his crucifixion looming off very close the next day. He can look up to the Father and he can say, I have brought you glory. I have completed, I've completed the work you gave me to do. Well, then you take it to its ultimate conclusion. If you go over to chapter 19. In chapter 19, and we come to John's, um, John's account of the crucifixion. And we read what in, in John's account are the very, very last words of Jesus. As he bows his head and just before he gives up his spirit, he says, it is finished. It is finished. It is completed. It is done. I have come to do the Father's will. Let that soak in. I have come to do the Father's will. I have obeyed the Father's will. Now, after six hours of agony and offering up his life as the, the atonement for our sins, he can look to the Father and say, it is finished. Jesus is, for us who believe, the bread of life because he obeyed the Father's will. Our life, our living in him, is here, exists because he obeyed the Father's will. Our, our life is the result of his obedience. You see, because... Because Jesus said yes to the Father, the Father says yes to us. Because Jesus said yes to do the Father's will, the Father says yes to us when we come to His Son in faith. He welcomes us. He receives us. And oh, worship. Worship and, and praise Jesus Christ for the fullness of his obedience. Give thanks for the fullness of his obedience. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 2, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So how is it that Jesus can be the bread of life? And the focal point, the spotlight becomes is thrown on this reality. He can be that bread of life because he obeyed the Father's will. Now, as those who have received the bread of life and come to follow Jesus Christ, is that the driving force that we have? Is that the thing that is our greatest motivation? We want to obey the Father's will. Now, here's our third question. How is it possible for us to come and eat? How is it possible for us to come and eat? Or how do I access this bread of life, this essential nourishment that I need to live, this, this very life of God? How do, I, how do I come and eat? Well, Jesus makes it, Jesus makes it plain. Verse 29, John chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus answered, the work of God is is this, to believe, to believe in the one he sent. In verse 40, Jesus says, For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him has eternal life. And if you go down to verse 47, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. How do I access this how do I access this bread? How do I access this nourishment? Well, John's account makes it very, very plain in, his, in this repeated emphasis that John records that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. We eat this bread. We, we take the bread of life by believing in and trusting and relying upon Jesus. We take this nourishment, the very life of Jesus, as we continually trust in Him. John's emphasis is on belief, which means a, a trust in or a reliance upon. We access the bread of life, and we continue to access the bread of life 
Because faith is not a one-time, once-upon-a-time prayer that I pray. Faith is the ongoing lifeblood of the believer. We eat by faith in, trust in, reliance upon the Lord Jesus. And in this life that I receive by faith, this bread that nourishes me, this relationship that I now enter by faith, I want you to know, and this is very important, I want you to know there is a security. There is a security to this. Jesus shows us this in verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Let that soak in. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and he who comes to me I will never drive away. The basis, my friends, the basis of our security is the sovereign grace of God. Do you hear what Jesus is, is, is telling us? If, if, if you're a believer, if you are a Christ follower, and you've come to receive Christ in, in your life, you were, you were given to the Son, you were given to the Son by the Father. All whom the Father has given me will come to me. You were given to the Son by the Father, not because of anything about you, not because God saw some good qualities in your life, and he said, well, you know, in Bob Veneman, the good kind of outweighs the bad, and he looks like he's going to be a faithful person. No, 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 not at all. Not because of anything within me or within you. Salvation is not brought to us because we initiated anything. How can we initiate it? When the Bible says we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Salvation is not brought to us because of anything we have initiated, but because God in grace chose us. God in grace chose us. God in grace chose us and said that he is giving us as a, as a gift to his son. The initiative is God's. As John reminds us in 1 John 4, 19, we love, we love him because he first loved us. Oh, here is, our, here is our security. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive, I will never drive away. And then look down to verse 40. Here it is emphasized again. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in Him shall have eternal life. That's a present possession. Shall right now have eternal life. And then in the future, and I will raise Him up at the last day. What a, what a secure position. You've been given, if, you're, if you've received Christ, you've been given the present possession of eternal life and the promise that in that last day when Christ returns and everything is, is completed that he has begun, that you will be raised up in a glorious resurrection body. And that is absolutely certain. You see, here is our security for the present. Here is our security for the future. And this is very humbling because what this means is I can, I, can take no, I can take no credit for this. I can take no credit for this. If you look into verse 44, it says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. I can take no credit for this. You see, God reveals this truth to us about the, his, his sovereignty and salvation. God reveals this truth of His sovereign grace always as a word of encouragement, as a word of security, as a motivation to our obedience. And it is humble. It is humble. Because I can take absolutely no credit. Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Are you hungry? Have you eaten? My prayer.
prayer this morning is that the light of the gospel, the good news, is shining in your life. That you have come to see your greatest need, your greatest hunger, and by faith to discover Jesus Christ as the bread of life who will truly fill your life with his abundance and meet you at the point of your greatest need. He is today the bread of life, the giver of life, because he obeyed the Father's will. My salvation is not the product of my obedience. My salvation is the product of the obedience of the Son of God. And oh, the joy, oh, the joy, oh, the security that brings in an uncertain world, in an uncertain time. What can I be certain of? I can be certain of who I am in Christ. I can be certain that I have access, continual access to the bread of life. I can be certain that my life, as Paul would say to the Colossians, is, is hidden with God in Christ. It cannot be touched. It cannot be taken away. And oh, my friends, what a message we have to share. What a message we have to share with an unbelieving world. Let's just bow our heads together in, in for just a quick moment of prayer, and then we're going to close our worship with, uh, with a song. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come under the hearing of your word. Lord, grant to us understanding, open blind eyes, give understanding, draw men and women, young people, boys and girls, to yourself. And may those who know you praise you, and may, the, may those who have experienced your love magnify you and be eager to share the good news of life in Jesus. We ask this all in his precious name.
quotation from Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. May God bless you.